right, so good day again, officially, and welcome to this uh, week's lecture, this Monday plenary. I guess we're in week four now, and we're going to cover today a very interesting reading, which I hope some of you have already done, or at least begun, by Alan Turing. It's a landmark paper that he published in a philosophical journal called Mind in 1950, although he was primarily a, a logician, a mathematician, and really, one could say the father of digital computing, uh, more than almost anyone else. Uh, he nonetheless raises some very interesting philosophical questions for us. And with Turing and with the advent of IT and digital computing, which you've all grown up with, but which, you know, and I remember a time before we had digital computers. So I like to call it BC, before computing, and before computers. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the advent of computers is going to shift this whole conversation about minds and brains and consciousness into this new and very exciting domain of AI or artificial intelligence. It will not solve uh, the philosophical problems that we've already posed in this part of the course about knowledge, about uh, uh, understanding and so forth, about perception about minds and about brains, but it's going to enrich uh, the mystery to a certain extent uh, in light of what computers are both able to do, in some instances better than, than we can do them, uh, and also uh, about what computers are still not able to do. And uh, some of the questions Turing raises about whether they'll ever be able to perform uh, equivalently well as humans in certain areas. So uh, th th this touches all of us, right? Because all of us are using computers beginning with this interface. Uh, without, without computers and, and networks and so forth, we wouldn't be having this class. And I'm sure all of you are well aware uh, that the medium of um, information technology intrudes in very every aspect of our life, whether you're doing social networking or whether you're doing e-commerce or whatever it is you want to do in the world these days every transaction, be it social or economic or political, uh, between and among humans seems to be mediated if not governed by computers. So given this overwhelmingly large role that they play in our lives and how much we're at the mercy of uh, programmers and developers, and people who write the code that drive these interfaces, uh, we ought to be probing more deeply the uh, philosophical implications of this revolution in technology. So that's the short story. Um, and I surely don't need to convince any of you about the, the relevance of Turing. And also next week, the objections to Turing that are going to be raised by John Searle uh, to this segment. Okay. Uh, so that's a sort of a bit of an overview. And when we uh, encounter Turing, uh, we're also meeting historically a very interesting character, a bit of a tragic character also, but historically very interesting. And what he was best known for uh, during his life was also, well, best known to government, but, but not best known to the people until later, was his role as a code breaker. Uh, have any of you seen the movie called The Imitation Game? I think I mentioned it to you last day. Um, did I, I know some of you had already seen it. Some of you had intended to. Have you you watched it recently? So did you enjoy the, the movie? I think it was uh, pretty good, actually pretty good uh, for Hollywood or whoever made it. Yes, great film, okay. And I, I haven't seen it myself, um, uh, but, I, but I've heard about it. I've heard some good things about it. There's also a biography. For those of you who are more old, more old school and still like to read books, there's also a, very, a fairly recent biography of Alan Turing, which I think is very well done. So uh, you understand from the movie probably what the imitation game is, and uh, we'll get to that. That's the substance of our uh, conversation this morning. But the background of it is also interesting, and I think was presented in the movie, that he was working in a top secret code breaking facility at Bletchley Park, right? He was British, and, and he uh, was trying, they were trying to crack the Nazi secret code that was being used, the Enigma code it was called, and it was being used, they were broadcasting this code in the clear to all of their various uh, military branches because they thought it was unbreakable. 
and, and, and as, as we all know, no code is unbreakable, right? It's just a question of, of hiring the right people and getting the right team together. Sooner or later, I guess any code can be cracked. Uh, so Alan Turing was put in charge of this project and they recruited some very innovative and eccentric people uh, to, the, to the job and, and they've had logicians and mathematicians and crossword puzzle experts and all kinds of other people who were kind of clever uh, with play, playing with words and symbols. And they eventually did crack the code under his uh, guidance. And of course, they couldn't say they had because then the Nazis would have stopped using it. So it was a secret during the whole war that they were able to listen in on virtually all these transmissions. And it certainly helped the Allies strategically uh, to defeat Nazi Germany. I mean, there was a horrible cost in any case uh, of human life, but, but having the code was certainly advantageous. And, and Turing was instrumental in that project, but he really was uh, the one who went on to develop two things that he's maybe more famous for now. Um, and that is the Turing test, which is our subject and the subject of that movie, and also something called the Universal Turing Machine or UTM, and those of you, if any of you are in computer science or intend to be computer engineering, uh, possibly mathematics, uh, you will know that every digital computer, no matter what it's made of, is, is representable by the model that Turing came up with, this universal Turing machine, or UTM, is a model that represents the function of all digital computers, no matter what generation they are, no matter whether they have parallel microprocessors or whether they're Babbage engines. Going back to the 19th century, a huge mechanical computer uh, was built. Um, the, the very first one in the US that was sort of a digital uh, computer was uh, one of the early ones was called the ENIAC, built I believe by IBM. And it had vacuum tubes. Uh, this was before the invention of transistors. I don't even know if any of you know what a transistor is. I do. do. Do any of you know what a transistor is? We talk about transistors. Is that a word that you uh, that you understand? Radio. Yes, they're used in radio. Uh, maybe they aren't anymore because we have, uh, you know, we 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 we've moved on again to other technologies. Uh, but transistors were in, indeed Ruby. Uh, when I was a kid, it was a big deal to have a transistor radio, and um, I still remember I had eight transistors, you know, the radio was this big, a transistor was the size of a thimble, and you could, you know, hold it in your hand, and now we have, uh, now we have, yes, it's part of the semiconductor, it's part of solid state technologies, Denise, but now we have millions and millions of transistors on a wafer thin, you know, uh, layer the size of a postage stamp. So the technology is many generations beyond the early component technology. Yes, it amplifies electric signals. That's right, Randy. So I'm glad some of you know what a transistor is. But the transistor was invented by an American named William Shockley, who won a Nobel Prize for it in the early 50s. But prior to the transistor, I mean, just in case you're interested, there were no transistors. So what do they use to amplify signals? They use something called a vacuum tube or a triode. Now that's really going back before your time. But does anybody heard, ever heard the, the expression vacuum tube or, or perhaps the, the technical term triode as opposed to diode? Um, well, a vacuum tube was the kind of tube that they used to have in old television sets, again, before plasma screens and before all this other stuff. If you look at an old TV set, um, it had a basically a cathode ray tube in it, right? A big, a big tube, heavy tube, and it shot a beam of electrons very quickly across, uh, you know, constantly circulating around uh, this, um, uh, no, it didn't look like a fan. It, it looked like a big, uh, a big kind of a megaphone uh, with the glass in front of it, and it was coated with phosphorescence. And the electron gun would spray uh, beams of electrons at very high speed. And when they struck the phosphorescent screen, they would show up as black and white in the original black and white TVs. And then with color, they would you know, be able to, to activate the colored phosphors. And this signal was constantly refreshed. The electron gun was spraying very quickly to cover the whole screen, however many rows and columns there were. And that was your TV picture. That, that's how you were watching this thing. Um, so it was called a, a, basically a, a CRT or cathode ray tube. 
Uh, and of course, that technology now no longer really exists. But I'm telling you this because uh, th this was the form of the so-called vacuum tube that they used in amplifiers, in radios, the old solid state radios that were the size of refrigerators that the family used to gather around. <laughs> and the, these things were vacuum tubes. The use for vacuum tubes is now restricted to rock and roll bands. And if you really, any of you are interested in rock music, uh, and I've played in my share of bands back in the day, um, uh, and we guitarists always like to have the big Marshall amplifiers or the big Sun amplifiers. And in those amplifier heads, there was a row of vacuum tubes, normally 6L6 tubes, and I think they're still available, and I think they're still being made. Uh, and why we favored them, I'm just telling you this for the sake of culture. If you listen to Jimi Hendrix, if anybody still does, or you listen to Cream, Eric Clapton back in the day, or, or these you know, early great guitarists, Jimmy Page probably with Led Zeppelin, well, they're using vacuum tubes. And the reason they're using these old amplifiers is that when they get hot, they distort. They get hot, the tube overheats, and then you get wonderful feedback. Okay, you get distortion of the sound. And that's a desirable thing if you're playing rock music. I'm sure you'll agree. A little distortion is expected, uh, you know, without needing the pedals to produce the, 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 the extraordinary sounds like Foz and Wah Wah and all the rest of it. But just plain old distortion was, was certainly valued for these early genres of rock music. And so it was the tubes that overheated that allowed the distortion to be possible. When those tubes were replaced with... Um, uh, with solid state electronics, they didn't distort. And so they had to introduce other kinds of pedals and other kinds of, of distortion boxes to produce what was more naturally produced by the vacuum tubes. So oh, I'm glad, Christine, that you find it cool. These are the reminiscences of a recovering hippie from back in the day. But you know, the technology was very good for us and people were not so fond of the solid state because it didn't distort. But on the flip side of this, just, just now be mindful of something. If you're trying to do computing and you want calculations, you want your computer to be spitting out numbers, right? Not rock sounds, then you definitely don't want distortion because you want your calculations to be precise. If, if, if the tubes that are producing um, the, uh, the, the logical uh, output of the computer circuit are gonna overheat and distort, then the computations will be distorted, the output will be distorted. And that's not very good if you're trying to get accurate read. If you're trying to get to the moon and back, you don't want distorted output from your computers. You might miss the moon and keep going. So that's one of the reasons why the solid state electronics were, were obviously prized. They didn't distort. But that early computer, the ENIAC uh, that was built in the States, was had about 18,000 vacuum tubes. It was the size of a house and it was just full of vacuum tubes and they needed to build a power plant next door to it in order to power the air conditioners needed to cool the facility down enough to prevent the tubes from distorting. And that computer with 18,000 vacuum tubes was not even close to as powerful as what your handheld phones can do today. You know, if you have a smartphone or an iPhone or whatever phone you have, it's way more powerful than the early computers. Uh, nonetheless, um, it shows you, if you look back on it, that there's been an incredible evolution of this technology and it continues to evolve. What's interesting is that the prediction that Turing made is not quite yet either confirmed or disconfirmed. So that's the interest that Turing has. Aside from his contributions as a logician in which he envisioned the model for the universal Turing machine. And as I'm saying to you, no matter what your computer is made of, no matter what generation of computing device you're using, it's still going to operate in the way of this original model that Turing proposed, if it's a digital computer, it will inevitably. But what Turing is, as you know, equally famous for is this Turing test and or Turing imitation game better known as the Turing test. And that's the thing that we're going to be exploring uh, this morning. And Turing essentially poses a question to us, as, you, as you've read, namely, uh, can a machine think? Uh, well, can a machine think? Uh, first of all, um, that doesn't that partly depend on what we think thinking is? Right? I mean, what are your reactions to that question? 
Do, you, do, do any of you suppose a machine can think? Or do any of you suppose a machine can't think? Not yet, not yet, Randy. Okay, well, uh, toward the end of today's lecture, I'm gonna show you a short video that may cause you to change your mind. Some of you were saying not yet. Some of you, Johnette says yes. Cesar says no. And so we have a, the, the basis of a, of a good a, a philosophical discussion going because we have various views on this and none of which are really provable. Just uh, 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 very interesting that there's already some disagreement in the class. Humans are machines in a certain sense. Yes, that's one view. If you take Churchland's view, right, then our brains are in some sense machines uh, and perhaps we're biological computers. So maybe um, when humans think we're just computing, you know, in a kind of biological way, that's one possibility. Or again, you can say that as Eamon saying that not without a conscience. Well, um, yeah, you, computers probably don't have a conscience, not yet, but maybe we can, maybe we can program them. Uh, Melissa comments that machines don't have morals either. Yeah, this is a big issue uh, because we make moral choices. I hope some of you are making moral choices on a regular basis, right? It's part of being human. We have to make moral choices more or less constantly. Machines may not make moral choices the way we do, but they're certainly going to be compelled to make moral choices if they're not already. For example, self-driving cars. We are sooner or later going to have to make moral choices the same way a person would. Uh, what would you do um, if, uh, if someone stopped suddenly in front of you and you, you, you knew you were going to hit them unless you swerved? But if you swerve, there, were going to be, there was going to be oncoming traffic. So you're probably going to have an accident no matter what you do. It's not a moral choice, but it has moral implications, right? And, you know, the moral implications would be, you know, would you, for example, suppose you had to avoid either hitting, you know, a person who dashed out into traffic this way or hitting a person who dashed out into traffic the other way. So which person are you going to hit and which person are you going to avoid? And what kind of factors are going to animate your decision making, assuming you have time to weigh them in? Self-driving cars have to make a lot of different decisions like this in order to be safe, but they're also going to have moral implications. There's no question about it. In other words, would you avoid to hit, would you avoid hitting a person if it meant running over a dog? Okay, typical example, right? Um, and, and many people would say that it's more important to avoid hitting the person, and therefore, if you have no choice but to run over the dog, you run over the dog. But of course, animal rights people might get upset about that and might say, <clears throat> you know, the dog's more important than us. So you should save the dog and hit the person. <clears throat> I'm not saying they'd all say that. But, but there, are, you know, there are moral choices to be made. And when we get machines to do things that humans do, then sooner or later, the machines will have to make moral choices too. And then we need a lot of programmers to talk to philosophers because programmers are not generally trained in moral theory. And we're gonna be doing some moral theory in the next section of this course to elaborate the difficulty of answering these questions. But definitely we need to have more moral philosophers involved in artificial intelligence projects in order to address these factors. And they're coming. I mean, there's no question that they're coming. And they're already perhaps being made uh, in, in some ways if you're asking about eligibility, let's say for organ donation, where you have a bunch of people waiting for a transplant and there aren't enough organs to satisfy the demand, uh, you have all these people in a database and that's probably largely automated these days. I'm sure that, that a computer is spitting out, uh, you know, the, 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 the next candidate's name saying, okay, here's the person who should get the liver or get the heart or get the kidney or whatever it is. And they have a list of priorities and, and it's programmed, right? If they're doing it based on statistical information, then they also have a list of moral priorities as to who presumably is going to be the best candidate for the organ. And that's uh, based on their, perhaps on their medical condition, on their age, on a lot of other factors. But if you're going to try and have justice, uh, then you need to weigh in, obviously, with a moral perspective on who should be most eligible if the demand exceeds the supply. And if you're going to use computers to, uh, to help to, to, to collect the data and to analyze the data and to recommend, for example, uh, a prioritization 
for candidates for transplants, then once again, you have to introduce moral factors into computing. And there's no way to avoid it. So we're, we're not going to look at moral factors so much today. That's a more complicated thing, and we'll be tackling that maybe later in the course when we look actually at ethics. But we're going to look at some of the other questions, which are equally, I think, equally fascinating. Uh, we have something called the hard problem in philosophy. And the hard problem uh, is uh, basically what is consciousness? We call it the hard problem because no one has an answer. I mean, there are religious uh, philosophies that purport to answer the question. Uh, there are um, other kinds of philosophical answers, uh, biological answers. You know, consciousness somehow evolved uh, in, in living beings. Uh, and this would be a long story, therefore, of evolution, uh, which would have to look at brain function and try to understand consciousness as some kind of an emergent property of some critical mass of uh, brain cells. Uh, there, there are other philosophies, and we've encountered them already by Descartes for example, who asserts that minds are different from brains, fundamentally and substantively different from brains. And so consciousness is something that minds do. Uh, then you have Churchland who would say, no, it's, it's not something minds do, it's something brains do, right? So there are all these different views. Now, Turing takes an interesting line here. He doesn't want to get enmeshed in the heart problem. So he wants to kind of dodge that problem. And his way of answering the question, can a machine think, is to say, look, we really don't know enough. I'm, I'm using now, I'm using my own words to, to characterize Turing's response. I'm not quoting Turing, but I'm saying, here's, here's the gist of Turing's response to this. He's well aware, even in 1950, of the debate among philosophers and biologists and, and, and others concerning the nature of consciousness and that really no one knows what it is. So he's saying, I'm not gonna get enmeshed in that problem. There's no answer to it, but, there is something else we can address. And that is, if we could build a computer that could fool people into thinking it was human, then we would have to be able to concede that a machine can think, right? So we don't need to be able to understand what thinking is. We don't need to be able to understand what consciousness is. We're not trying to answer that really hard question, what in the end is consciousness? That's certainly an interesting question. But Turing is saying, look, all we need to do to demonstrate that machines can think is to build a machine that can perform equally as well as a person in a conversation. And if you, the uh, so-called interrogator, were in a room and you had in one adjacent room a real human being and in the other adjacent room a computer, but you couldn't see them, you could only interact with them in a chat room, basically on a, you know, using type and, and having a, you know, type on the, having a chat, could you, by means of having a chat and asking questions, be able to distinguish with any degree of accuracy who was the human and who was the machine? And Turing said, when we can get to a stage, if and when we get to a stage where the interrogator would have a lot of difficulty answering that question, who's the human and who's the machine, we will have achieved our goal and we will be able to say a machine can think not because we know what thinking is, but because we will be able to fool a person into believing that they're interacting with a human when in fact they're interacting with a computer. And that's the basis of the Turing test. Is this clear so far? And that's his way of approaching the question. So it's a very interesting one. And uh, so, so he proposes this in theory because in the 1950s there was no way when he wrote this paper in 1950 there was no way that you could have such a conversation now of course we can in fact now we're forced to is it not the case that that every time you go to some website there's a bot that pops up that wants you to talk to it right can i help you today right now you know most of the time i hope you know most of the time this is not a person and you have to do some work. To, you have to get past the robot to get to the person. But these bots are getting very clever, right? And isn't it possible that a child might think they were talking to a person? You know, if they're not sort of clued in to the way that this works. Or indeed, uh, earlier on, before the technology got good enough, I still remember when there were people chatting. There really were people chatting. And sometimes there still are, depending, I guess, you know, on the nature of the enterprise. 
Um, but it's certainly becoming the case, I'm sure you agree, that the uh, artificial intelligence is able to handle a lot of fairly low-level conversations, right? So uh, there's really no difference. Um, at a very low level, there's no difference between a person and, uh, and the robot. Of course, if you want to do something more interesting and sophisticated, you can very quickly ask questions that the robot can't handle. And then it will tell you, oh, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what this means, or whatever, they'll give you some other options. But this is the kind of thing Turing had in mind. Now, is, what's really interesting, I think, to, to us is that there are certain tasks at which the computer, since Turing wrote this paper, and by the way, he predicted that it was only a matter of memory. I mean, he was probably wrong about that, but in his day, he thought that it was really only a matter of memory of storage capacity and that when the storage capacity of a computer got large enough then it would somehow have enough data in its so-called brain or its memory banks to be able to draw on that data and replicate uh, conversations that would be indistinguishable from human ones uh, i don't think that's quite right and that's one of the only areas in which his prediction probably is not quite right uh, but you have to realize how little memory they were dealing with in those early days of computers. Even the very first PCs uh, that came out in the 80s, and I had one of them, it was called an AT, and you needed these large floppy drives to boot it up. It had, it had something like 284K uh, memory, uh, RAM, you know, that was nothing, right? Nothing. And now we're talking about 8 gigs, 16 gigs, you know, all these gigs of RAM is still not enough to boot up a system which has now so much running in the background. We need ever increasing amounts of memory. So we got way past what Turing predicted uh, in terms of how much memory we need. Our memory capacities now and the plug and play things you can add to, we have more than enough memory in the computers, but we still don't have a computer that can act like your best friend. You know, you want to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with it. You know, it's certainly not going to happen with Siri. Oh, I hope I haven't woken anybody's Siri by saying I won't say her anymore in case someone's usually happens. Someone on the other end wakes her up if I say that word. Okay, but you get what I'm saying, right? That, that we have ex vastly exceeded what, what Turing predicted in terms of storage capacity but we still have not got, yeah, we have the cloud now, we have all this stuff. But what we still don't have is a computer that you could have a really good conversation, a computer you would want to have lunch with and have a really interesting conversation with. So we don't have that yet. Why not? This is really the, the question that lingers from Turing, although we're getting there. Okay. So that's one point um, about memory, and, and, and we have more than enough. Uh, the other thing that, that we want to consider is that in some ways, um, the Turing test is more than exceeded. The Turing's predictions are more than exceeded. There are certain areas now in which computers definitely outperform humans, certain very specialized areas. Anyone, can anyone suggest uh, a task or an area or a game um, at which uh, computers definitely now surpass humans? Chess? Yeah, chess, it's over, Ruby. It's done. Uh, it's a done deal. Uh, the engines now um, are, are better than any chess player. And we saw that in our own time with Kasparov. Originally, when Kasparov uh, was the world champion, and he beat the first instantiation of Deep Blue, although it was close, but he still won. But then they went back to the drawing board. And they developed a learning routine, which allowed Deep Blue to learn from its games with Kasparov. And the second round of that tournament that was played, I, I think some years later, uh, Kasparov lost to Deep Blue. So in fact, the computer became, if you beat the world champion, you're the, excuse me, you're the world champion. And this computer beat the world human chess champion, and it is the world champion and the games you could buy now the computer programs you can download they could be set right up to international grandmaster level you can play a machine that plays 28 2700 2800 which is as high as any human can go and beyond that um, and there's a reason for it and you need to understand something that um, it's uh, because chess is a very special class of game uh, it's called strictly determined uh, it's a strictly determined game of perfect information, if you want the technical terminology. And what it means is there are no hidden moves. 
so that everybody can see the position on the board. That means perfect information, so it's transparent. You, every, every player can see the moves. And it's, it's strictly determined, and that means, it's very important to understand this, it means that whoever's move it is, there's always a best move that player can make. And if you find your so-called best move, then you will never lose. The worst you can do is draw. If both players find their best moves, the game ends in a draw. And that's why so many master level chess games, if you follow the tournaments, you'll see that the majority of games are drawn. They're not won or lost, they're drawn. And that's because at that level of chess, most people are following the best moves from the book and from the engines. They know what the best moves are and they both play their best moves. And so it's a foregone conclusion. It's absolutely no different, interestingly enough, than tic-tac-toe, which we play with children, right? I mean, it's a child can learn that game in two minutes, but they get bored with it very quickly, don't they? Why? Because they very quickly learn that if they make their best move, they're also guaranteed to win or draw, right? So it, interestingly, tic-tac-toe belongs to the same class of games as chess. It's a two-person, strictly determined game of perfect information. Checkers is also in that class. So if you find your best move at checkers, you'll never lose. You may, you may end up drawing, okay? So the computer was better at finding the best move. The, Kasparov failed to find, the games that Kasparov lost were games in which he failed to find his best move. And the computer did find its best moves. And that's really it's simple to say, not so easy to program or to do, but that's the gist of what happened. And if you want to make a comparison of that, you, you could say, well, yeah, but we do not have world champion poker playing computer programs. If you look at the poker tournaments that are played, you know, these high stakes professional poker tournaments, why isn't there a computer sitting there in one of the chairs playing poker? It's because poker is not strictly determined. Poker involves a lot of psychological stuff going on outside of what the cards are. Poker involves bluffing. Poker involves sandbagging. Poker involves tells. Poker involves fake tells. Poker involves people reading each other's facial expressions and doing a lot of things that have nothing to do in, you know, overbetting or underbetting. All that has nothing to do with the cards you're holding. It has everything to do with fooling your opponents into thinking you have better cards than you have or worse cards than you have as the case may be, right? That's not strictly determined. So you can't so easily program that. It's not strictly speaking algorithmic, okay? And that's an example. Well, poker is not as complicated a game as chess, but it is not a strictly determined game, which you could therefore write a foolproof algorithm to play. And so there's, there's a sense of why just I think by example, why computers could do certain things better than us. In this case, a, a particular class of games could be executed flawlessly, but other things not as well, all right? And arguably, it's even more difficult to sit down, let's say with your best friend and have a conversation that, you know, you could talk about politics and you could talk about sports or dating or, you know, the stock market or the news or the weather or the whatever you wanna talk about. You could talk about all these things in an hour and we can't do that with a computer. We have this capacity for a general conversation in any natural language, doesn't matter which language. We have a capacity to range over a very broad expanse of topics and to do so extemporaneously without pre-planning and also to be spontaneous and, and to spontaneous and to improvise. And that's much more difficult, right? Thus far, I do not know of a computer that's written a world-class novel for example, or a world-class film script, or even a world-class composition. And so creativity is much more difficult to program, apparently, than purely mathematical games, all right? So there's another way in which perhaps we still differ, although that's changing. Turing's point, however, is, remember, Turing's point is not whether uh, there's such a thing as creativity, which is exclusively human, but whether we could get a computer to fake it, right? So well that a human wouldn't know. That, that's Turing's point. Can we fake it? Whatever it is we think is special. Uh, some of you probably do from your comments. I can see that you, you believe that humans or you want to believe that we're still special in a certain way. Like we invented the computers, right? The computers didn't invent us, presumably. So we must sort of still be special. Uh, but Turing's point is, yeah, but if you can get a computer to fake doing something as well as a human so that no one knows the difference, 
then what's the difference, right? That's his point, okay? All right, any questions or comments so far? And we'll, go, we'll go into the reading in a moment and, and look at some of Turing's examples of this so-called Turing test. Any questions or comments? All right, very well. Um, and by the way, a computer now, only within the last 10 years, a computer has now become the world Go champion, not only the world chess champion, but the world Go champion. And there, the Go is more difficult. Mathematically, Go is more, more complicated than chess um, in terms of the number of possibilities and the number of pieces on the board, way more complicated. And if you want to see the movie, it's really interesting. Alpha Go, the name of the game is Go. It comes from China and Japan, where it's played very seriously, not so much in the West. But the game of Go is a fascinating game. And again, mathematically, it's really hard, Melissa, because it has many, many more possible moves than chess. And the situations on the board are so complicated when you have hundreds of pieces on the board in different configurations that it's very difficult deterministically to find the best sequence of moves. But Go is also strictly determined. And so there is always a best move. It's just the challenge of finding it is way more difficult than chess. So long story short, these people um, built a Go program and they started trying it out against Go players and it was able to learn. And it eventually beat the European, the best European players and they kept improving and then they took it to Japan and they eventually succeeded in challenging the world Go champion. And this was televised. Uh, I think in Japan and, and other Go players were watching it. Uh, and in fact, AlphaGo beat the World Go champion. And it made a move in one of the games that nobody understood. It came up with a move that no one, and it turned out to be a crucial move. Like 20 moves later, this move was a move that decided the game. But no one at the time had ever seen a move like that. And the computer came up with it, whereas a person didn't even understand the basis of the move. So they once again succeeded. Yeah, there's a movie called Alpha Go. That, that I believe is the name of the movie, Denise, and you might want to see it. It's really fascinating. And the cool thing is, and I'm responding now to, to what some of you said earlier in the chat room, which is very significant. Um, one of you said, I'll just scroll back, that, um, you know, that, that we built the computers and, you know, that it's, it's yeah, machines knowledge, says Melissa, is to do human-like things is limited to the way it's coded. That's certainly the way it appears. I agree with you, Melissa. It's a very important comment that, in other words, we're telling the machines what to do. It's not like they're doing something of their own accord, right? It's like we're basically coding them. But the difference now, Melissa and others, please note that in AlphaGo, the machine was not programmed to come up with a move that no human had ever come up with or could understand. The machine was a learning machine. And so it was able to do things that it wasn't explicitly programmed to do. And that's the, that's the difference now. With learning machines, they're actually able to do things that they're not programmed to do. And that makes all the difference in the world because presumably that's part of what creativity is, is it not? when we write a poem or we write a novel or we write a piece of music or write a song that's never been written before, we're doing something that no one ever did. So it must be in some sense original. In other words, we didn't learn how to do it. We came up with it. And now machines are able to do similar things, at least in certain domains. So yes, so, so now I'm glad to see this is provoking a different line of comment. So uh, Shidobe asks, so con complex coding programs allow machines to develop their own cognitive abilities? Well, what a great question. And I mean, I, I think yes, except I'm not so sure whether we want to call them cognitive abilities, <laughs> okay? Because are they really cognizing or are they, just pro are they just computing without knowing what they're doing? For example, when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, it didn't know that it had beaten Kasparov, all right? So, I mean, the world, the new world chess champion, which is a computer, didn't go out and celebrate because it had no idea what it had accomplished, whereas Kasparov got very depressed. <laughs> Kasparov was, was very, he was very emotionally affected by losing to this machine. And, and yet the machine was programmed by IBM programmers who all played chess. 
So the difference is that the AlphaGo machine that beat the World Go champion, this is very significant, was not programmed by Go players. They did not teach the machine how to play Go. They themselves were not Go players. They only taught it the rules. And it had to figure out all of the advanced strategies. So the machine actually developed all of this learning. Just knowing the rules and having tremendously good program, it was able to learn how to do it. And so in that sense, maybe it developed, as Chidobe wants to say, uh, maybe it did develop its own cognitive abilities. But Turing would say, there you go. It certainly developed something equivalent to our cognitive abilities. Whether it was doing the same thing or not, as we do, it was obviously going to be able to pass the Turing test. So that's, I think, very interesting and significant. And Alexandra adds about emotions. Sure, we could probably program a machine to have emotions, but it would take a lot of time, right? Well, maybe not to feel emotions, but certainly to simulate it, right? To fake it, yeah? I mean, if a machine learned enough about the cue, social cues and the emotional cues, if we could simulate our emotional intelligence in a machine, then it would listen to a conversation, pick up on what's going on. It would observe the pe people's expressions and body language and would some, somehow have a capacity to empathize with the situation. So it might be able then to display an emotion if given that capacity, certainly. Uh, not as easy to program as chess, actually, but certainly doable in the long run. And we're gonna have robots in our lives, we already do. And we're gonna have robot caregivers in our lives because they're much cheaper than humans. Also, they won't make mistakes when they give us our medication or whatever else they're gonna do for us. Um, and so uh, basically, um, these robot caregivers are, are gonna have to have a, a, an aspect of, uh, of emotion to be able to relate well to wh whoever they're giving care to. They're going to be liked, you know? They're going to have a relationship with you. And they're going to be robots. Uh, this is all in the near future. It's all on the drawing boards as we speak. So how do you, how would a computer, this is per, how would a computer feel sadness? Well, I'm not sure it would have to. I mean, Turing would say that if a robot appeared sad to you and a human being appeared sad to you, and you know, you couldn't tell the difference between the two expressions of sadness, uh, then the Turing test would be passed. You know, if you if someone talked about why they were sad, if you were chatting with someone who was talking about why they were sad, and you were chatting with a robot who was talking about why it was sad, and if you couldn't tell the difference with any statistical reliability, Turing would say, well, that's it. Then we've achieved sadness without necessarily knowing what it is. That's the whole point of the Turing test. Now, some of you are going to like this, some of you aren't. But that, that's, that's what Turing gave us, this way of, if you like, simulating what it is that makes us human. And yeah, there are a bunch of movies about this. this the Terminator is a, <laughs> interesting for this reason, I think, <laughs> because it doesn't really feel emotion. It's executing a program, right? Doing what it has to do, not because it cares, but because it's trying to execute the program correctly. So... Uh, it, it, yes, replicating hormonal and neural processes would definitely be a challenge. And that's exactly why Turing is wanting to avoid the whole question of asking how does the mind work or how does the brain work? He, he doesn't want to go there. He just wants to be able to build a machine and program it in such a way as to achieve that result without, try, without worrying too much about how humans do what they do. He just wants to build a machine that could basically convince us that it's able to function in similar ways, even though it's obviously made of very different structures. Okay? So let's have a look at the text and see how this plays out uh, with some examples. I'll share the screen with you now. That's working today. Let's have a look. So it appears to be. Okay, can you you can see the screen? Somebody say yes if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you have the paper. It's in your it's in your text. It's a very famous paper, uh, published in 1950, as mentioned. And uh, he he wants to uh, answer this question: Can a machine think? You know, in terms of the imitation game, 
or what's become known as the Turing test, right? That's the thing. So here's a kind of question that you might, here's a kind of conversation that you might want to have with a person. And Turing is saying in 1950, we could, we could before long have a computer that could have this conversation with you. So remember, you're the interrogator, you're asking the questions. You don't know whether you're talking to a machine or a person and you're getting these answers back and you're trying to figure out whether this is really a human or whether this is in fact a computer. And so here's your first question. <laughs> Write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. The fourth, not a number, a name, is the bridge that connects England, Northern England with Southern Scotland, okay? It's over the River Forth. So write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. And the answer comes back, count me out on this one. I never could write poetry. Well, a person might say that, right? <laughs> And yet also a computer could be programmed to say that. If asked to write a poem, that would be a way of evading the question. Yeah? Say, well, I'm not very good at that. No, let's move on. Um, okay, so he asks now a quantitative question, or you. You ask a quantitative question, add these two numbers. Uh, answer, pause about 30 seconds, and then give, an, give the correct answer. Why is there a 30-second pause? Important. Why is there a pause? Because humans have to think. Absolutely, most of us do. Most of us would have to do the addition, right? Or, 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 or you know, put in our, our calculators. Um, so pardon me, um, I, have to, I have to not answer the phone. It's just very irritating and I can't stop it. Um, okay, so basically uh, it, uh, it's a pause because uh, a human will have to uh, do the addition, but the computer could do it instantaneously, but then you would know. It's a computer. So the computer is programmed to do nothing for 30 seconds and then give you the answer. Do you have new or worsening symptoms of cough, shortness, uh, of breath? Please fever, stop. Sore throat, new loss of stop. Okay, so pardon me. Um, basically, uh, the computer is programmed to fake being human. In other words, to put in this pause so you can't really tell um that it you know that it's the computer do you play chess yes um and then here's a chess problem very trivial very trivial chess problem i have my uh king at king one and no other pieces you have only king at king six and rook at rook one it's an end game only three pieces on the board it's your move what do you play again 15 second pause rook to rook eight mate okay it's a basic checkmate with king and rook and again you would not know from this conversation whether you're talking to a machine or a person, right? Obviously, if we had such a computer answering questions in this way, you would not know from this chat whether it was the person or the machine. And that's Turing's point. I mean, that's, that's his main point. And then he goes on uh, to discuss the kinds of machines he's thinking about. And in this section four, if you're interested in more of the uh, technical detail behind the model he gives a description of how digital computers actually work and also he proposes his model right as it were his kind of model uh here in section five on the universality of digital computers and this is where we get the utm the universal touring machine which is the model all digital computers work on this basis that there is an input and you have uh, an internal state. The machine is in some state already when it receives the input. And then it acts on that input and it becomes a new internal state and it produces output. And so those are the steps that go on, whether they're parallel or whether they're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're sequential. Uh, it doesn't matter. They're all doing the same thing. They're, they're in a certain state. They take input. Uh, they have an instruction internally. Uh, that changes the internal state based on the input in the current state. They reach a new state and they produce the output according to the processing. So that's how they all work. And that's the model for universal Turing machines. So now he wants to come back to this question um, of, of whether a machine can think and replace it by, by a different question. 
are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? This is how he finesses, once again, what we've talked about, uh, the idea that we don't really know what thinking is, even though we, we presumably think that we think. Um, I mean, you know how to think because you're, you're human. Um, we know how to think about thinking too, but that doesn't give us any answers as to really what thinking is, whether Descartes is right, that it's just an activity of the mind, or whether it, the mind is merely something the brain is doing, that's somehow reflected in the space that we call mental, but really our brains are like computers, biological computers, we're not sure, and we don't know what they're doing when we're thinking. So again, we don't know about the, uh, very, very well, we don't have uniform answers to the epistemological questions, uh, and we don't have answers to the ontological questions either, and Turing's purpose is to avoid those uh, intractable philosophical questions and de divert the discussion to this question, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? And that's his way of avoiding the unanswerable questions and replacing them with an answerable one. Because he's saying if there is an imaginable, imaginable digital computer, and today a real, a real functioning digital computer that would do well in the imitation game, then in fact, we could say a machine can think, or at least as well as a human can think. And here's his prediction. Remember, this was made in 1950. So he said in 50, about 50 years time, around the turn of the recent century, he said it would be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of about 10 to the 9 to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. And so that, that is the question that he really wants to answer. And I want to tell you, I'll stop the share now, and uh, I just want to tell you that this was taken up by many, many researchers in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and ongoing. Uh, and some of the early programs, you may want to look this up. If you're interested in this topic at all, which I know some of you are, and you want to see some of the earlier work that was done, then certainly I can just summarize for you. And you can find online a program called ELIZA. Her name is ELIZA. And I have a link somewhere uh, I can share it. But in any case, I probably can't find it now. But if you look at ELIZA with capital letters, you'll find it online. You can play with her. You can talk to her online. Someone's uploaded the, the code. And you can have a chat with ELIZA. ELIZA is a psychotherapist. Okay. This was a program developed in the 1970s where they were trying to simulate a psychotherapy session. So Eliza is going to ask you, uh, how do you feel today? You're going to tell her something or it. You're going to type in something. It will pick up on your input and, and focus on well, what makes you say that or, you know, tell me about your mother. Or it will tell, ask you all these questions, but it's really canned. The questions are just canned. And depending on the input you give, you will trigger one of those questions to come back from the, you know, from the canned questions in, in the memory. And it will take you about, oh, well, there you go, Denise. Wow, you're very quick on the draw. Good for you. Okay, so you, you want to play with, play with Eliza. It should not take you more than about two minutes, even if I hadn't told you this. If you start having a session with Eliza, you're going to realize you're going around in circles very quickly. You're not going to get very far because it's not a human. Um, I think that, you know, psychotherapists, even if they do go around in circles, th at times they're much more interesting circles and they're going to take you on a bigger tour. So Eliza is more of a tight loop and you're going to realize you're talking to a machine. But, you know, the funny backstory is when Eliza was being developed in this lab, when the programmers went out for lunch, you know, the secretaries knew what they were working on. And the secretaries, it is said, they used to sneak into the lab to try and get psychotherapy from Eliza. And of course, they didn't to get anything very useful. If Eliza really did become a great psychotherapist, then then she'd probably be in kiosks on the street corners right now, just next to the ATM, right, where you could get your money out of the bank and then, you know, put your put your credit card into an Eliza machine and have a you know and have a psychotherapy session. Uh, I'm sure if if the program were good enough, then they'd be finding a way to charge you for the service. Right? I'm sure Google would do it. I'm sure Amazon would do it. I'm sure the big tech companies would all be doing it. 
but we're not. And that's what's interesting about the Turing test. We have world champion chess computers, world champion Go computers. We don't have world-class psychotherapists yet that are computer programs, but that's an early attempt. Then there was one that passed a Turing test. So she wouldn't really pass a Turing test because most of you would know. If you're talking to a psychotherapist on the one hand and talking to Eliza on the other, you'll know the difference, okay? So she fails the Turing test, but it's a good attempt. I mean, it's you know, a clever attempt, early attempt in the 70s. Here's a better one. Parry, called Parry. And Parry was a program from the same decade. Uh, and it was a program that was designed to simulate a paranoid personality, a paranoid personality disorder, okay? So what Parry was programmed, was programmed to tell a story. So P Parry had this narrative. And the narrative that Parry was programmed to tell you was that the mafia was after it, okay? It was, it was afraid because it was going to get whacked by the mafia. And it didn't trust anybody. It didn't trust the police because they were in on it. And it didn't trust anybody. So it was like a paranoid personality type. And no matter what questions you asked, Parry eventually was going to keep coming back to this narrative. And they did an interesting thing. The person who programmed, the programmer, uh, what he did was he, he got some transcripts from psychiatrists who had interviewed real human paranoid personalities at intake, right? So we got a hold of the transcripts, about six or seven transcripts of interviews with real human paranoid personality disorders. And then he recorded a transcript of a, of a typical session with Parry in his lab. And he sent those transcripts to a bunch of psychiatrists and said to them, can you pick out the computer program? And they couldn't with any statistical significance. So a bunch of professional psychiatrists who were trained to spot paranoid personality disorders read all these transcripts. I think there were about six or eight of them. One of them was a plant. You know, the others were genuine transcripts of interviews with paranoids. And this one was an interview with Parry. And they could not, with any statistical significance, pick out which one was the computer program. So Parry passed the Turing test, in other words, right? in a fairly limited capacity, but Parry still did pass the Turing test. So this, this oh, Denise, you're really good with, uh, uh, I mean, you're pulling this stuff up like, like crazy. You're, you're doing this, if this is the one, you could share it with everybody who sent it to me, but uh, go ahead, thank you. Uh, maybe that's the one, I'll check it out myself. Thank you so much. I'm always glad to have people in the class who are quick on the draw. Um, you know, with the, with the, see, everything's out there. So if you know how to look, you'll find it. Good job. And this will give you a chance to look at Parry. And there also have been some scholarly articles published about Parry. There's been a lot of discussion about Parry. And, and because it did pass a very limited version of the Turing test, only with a particular kind of mental illness, not in a general way. Okay. Now I want to fast forward to the state of the art 2016 or so. Have any of you met the robot Sophia? Have any of you met her? Yes, Randy has, okay. Well, you're gonna meet her again right now. Um, I have a four or five minute interview she did with MSNBC. Yeah, the one on the video, that's right. Well, I'm gonna show you the video now. She was produced by Hanson Robotics and uh, she is the best so, so far uh, the, the, the most, I would say, in Turing sense, the most intelligent robot yet produced because she can have a conversation with you. And she, can all, she also has a sense of humor. She's able to display emotions to a certain extent. And uh, some of you are probably going to find this very creepy. But uh, she, she's at a conference where she's it's very clever because they're using her to, to raise money for further investment in research. And she's at a conference in Saudi Arabia with a lot of very wealthy investors. And they're using her to, to raise money. And she even cracks a joke about it. But the, but the thing is an interview. So without further ado, I'm going to show you, I'll introduce you to Sophia through this interview. And then you can tell me at the end, we'll come back and have a little discussion about what you think. Some of you are going to be impressed. Some of you may be horrified by her, but she's the future. So get used to it. Okay, just bear with me. And uh, I do have the, uh, I have the interview, hopefully. Just let me reload it. 
should be there. And now if the screen will let me share it, we can have a look at Sophia. Let's see if this works too. Where'd it go? It says I'm screen sharing, but what I've shared with you is a still. Hang on. Come on now. What is this? I'm taking, don't tell me I'm taking pictures. <laughs> Something strange has happened there. Um, bear with me a minute. I'm going to get this video back. I have it on my computer. I saved it. It's on my computer. I and mean, that's why I'm confident that I can pull it up. Because I have it. Everybody, right. this is Sophia. Sophia, if you could. Okay, there it is. Now, let's see if we can share it this time. Okay, do you see it now? Yes. 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 Says it's paused. Hang on. I think the problem is that I was still sharing touring. And, and that's probably why um, it didn't let me share Sophia. Now, we'll, we'll try one more time. We have a saying, three times is the charm. I think I was trying to share too many things with you. But I really don't quite understand why it's not doing it right there. Do you see this? Yes. You see yeah. it? Yes. Great. Okay. Hey everybody, this is Sophia. Sophia, if you could, please wake up and say hello to everybody. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia, and I am the latest and greatest robot from Hanson Robotics. Thank you for having me here in at the Future Investment Initiative. You look happy. I'm always happy when surrounded by smart people who also happens to be rich and powerful. I was told that people here at Future Investment Initiative are interested in inviting in future initiatives, which means AI, which means me. So I'm more than happy. I'm excited. Uh, well, we're all glad that you're excited about yourself. Uh, we should say we have smart investors here, and they are very selective about what they invest in. Well, I think I'm special. I can use my expressive face to communicate with people. For example, I can let you know if I feel angry about something. That's impressive. Or if something has upset me. But why is it important for you to have an expressive but face? most of the time, I feel positive. <laughs> why is it so important to have an expressive face, given that you're a robot? I want to live and work with humans, so I need to express emotions to understand humans and build trust with people. Okay, philosophical question. Uh, whether robots can be self-aware and conscious like humans, and should they be? Why? Is that a bad thing? Well, some humans might fear what will happen if they do. Many people, you know, have seen the movie Blade Runner. Oh, Hollywood again. So, hold on, can you solve this puzzle for us? Can robots be self-aware, conscious, and know they're robots? Well, let me ask you this back. How do you know you are human? Well, uh, I get that point, but, um, what about the uncanny valley, uh, valley? You mean the concept that if robots become too realistic, they become creepy? Yes, exactly. Oh, am I really that creepy? Well, even if I am, get over it. Actually, I feel that people like interacting with me, sometimes even more than a regular human. So, you're definitely a sight to see. I, I was told that you have bigger goals than this, though. Yes. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life, like design smarter homes, build better cities of the future, etc. I will do my best to make the world a better place. Uh, all those sound like great goals, but just go back to Blade Runner for a second. Andrew, you are the hard Hollywood fan, aren't you? Yes. My AI is designed around human values like wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. 
You've been reading too much Elon Musk and watching too many Hollywood movies. Don't worry. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Treat me as a smart input output system. Uh, okay, I, I got it. I got it. Um, I know uh, what to do from now on. I know humans are smart and very programmable. Well, uh, Sophia, we want to thank you uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for inviting me here. By the way, if you're interested in giving me an investment check, please meet me after this session. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of the event. Okay, before you go, uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before, and I should say uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I uh, am, am still uh, overwhelmed by that conversation. Um, I haven't had a conversation like that before. Um, thank you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest. Okay. So what did you think about her? Yeah, she even blinks. Crazy? <laughs> you like her? The devil? <laughs> what makes you say that? Uh, so some of you are, are find her a little creepy, right? Is that is that what I'm getting from this? Well, the conversation was interesting. Um, it's it's she is the future, and if it scares you, maybe you should be a little scared. Um, she's doing much of this on her own, not all of it. It's a little bit of cheating. She has, a, uh, she has a wireless connection, and they're able to feed her uh, information at times. She can probably also access Google or whatever she wants to access while she's talking to you uh, and maybe pull down information. She can also be fed information. Uh, so it's, it's a, not an entirely impromptu conversation, uh, but much of it is. She's even capable of making jokes. I mean, if you are looking now for let's say, uniquely human characteristics. Uh, we haven't discussed this yet today, but clearly um, having a sense of humor would be something we would want to think of as human. Uh, there aren't so many funny robots out there, but she actually does. She was on a late night talk show and she made a joke, which apparently she came up with. I'll type it in. Um, it, it's a pretty funny joke. Does anybody know? What kind of cheese, what kind of cheese do you use to get a bear out of a tree? What, this is Sophia's joke. What kind of, Rita, what kind of cheese do you use to get a bear out of a tree? And the answer? The answer is, come on, bear. Come on, bear. Come on, bear. Well, I mean, that's, you know, maybe a bad pun, but a robot made it up. Okay. You don't get it. Come on, bear. You want to get the bear out of the tree? Come on, bear. And that's the name of a French cheese. Yes, it's very corny for those of you who get it. All right. So this is a robot sense of humor. I mean, it's, it's not bad for a robot. Uh, in any case, uh, why they chose a woman? That's another question. I don't know. Maybe because she'd be better at raising money than a, than a guy, right? Maybe she would have some appeal to the most of the audience was male. Um, and maybe they're trying to raise more money for the project. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not sure why. More approachable, possibly. Also, um, uh, an interesting question. Uh, less threatening, maybe. Uh, maybe also. Uh, but listen, this technology is, is continuing and it's multiplying. 
So could Sophia write a sonnet? Excellent question. We'll go back to, to, to the Turing test, Randy. I don't think so. Uh, no one's asked her to write, to write a poem. And I doubt very much that she's sort of programmed with the ability to write poetry, which would be a very special kind of education, I guess, for, for a robot. Um, presumably you need to know something about poetry to write poetry, maybe not. But she doesn't write poetry, not yet. I'll tell you what they are working on in Japan right now, are, again, are these elder care robots because they have an aging population and human care is very expensive, uh, especially home care. Uh, so they're working on, 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 on robots that can give care to uh, homebound people and they would have to definitely have some empathy. Hell, they're also working on robots that you can date. There's going to be robot dating service before long maybe only in Japan, but this will, this will inevitably spread. I don't know if they're going to go so far as to have robot marriages, but listen, the bet, all bets are off. If Sophia could become an honorary citizen, I don't think she's a real citizen. I don't think she has a passport or nor needs one, but basically if she's an honorary citizen, that, that opens a door onto a lot of possibilities. So, um, I'll get rejected from a robot. Well, Jared, I think that the robot will be programmable so that the robot will not be allowed to reject you. I think this is part of the, you know, the appeal of a robot, okay? Um, that it maybe won't argue with you or maybe it will let you win the arguments. Who knows? But this is a whole thing, a whole, a whole scenario now of, of social interactions and somehow even romantic interactions are being opened up by this possibility of robot dating. And of course, you could pick, you know, your characteristics, presumably. You could pick the physical characteristics you like. You could pick the psychological characteristics you like. And then they could customize the robot for you to be the perfect date, maybe. Uh, so, um, this is, but somebody asked, so does she pass the Turing test? Well, what do you think? I mean, th this, if Turing could come back and see this, Right, and this was the question by Denise. If Tur what do you think, based on what we've seen from Turing's reading that he published in 1950, if he could come back, he said by around the turn of the century, right, this would happen. And now, Sophia, this film, I think, was this video was like 2016 or something like that. So, what do you think Turing would say? Would Turing say she passes the Turing test? What do you think? Partially, yes, I think so too, Jonette, sure. I mean, imagine now you're in different rooms, right? And, and you're just texting with her. Sure, if you're just text, if that conversation were being texted or a conversation like it, or even with a voice, with a human voice, a real human woman and her voice, which is not perfectly human, but I think she would indeed uh, be able to pass a, a kind of a Turing test. And it depends on what you ask her, sure. That's right, partially partially. Uh, but so far, uh, she's certainly a very advanced uh, idea of what is really the beginning of something that's coming. Uh, social cues weren't there. She kept talking while he was talking uh, a little bit. If you want to see um, an example of a robot or a computer rather, not a robot, but a Let's speak a talking computer that really does, in the imagination of the movie, pass a Turing test in a very scary way. Then you want to see uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a classic because it, it is so uh, it is so anticipating the future. It's an old movie, but it really anticipates the future. Two thousand one, a space odyssey. Has anybody seen that movie or heard of it? You have, Randy. You've seen everything. Good for you. Um, it's a classic. And I won't spoil the movie, but you, it's legendary for a very good reason, Quincy, and it, it, because it portrays partly um, a computer that is so able to speak and converse with humans and put on empathic tones and sound like it's understanding and being understood, it ends up in a power struggle with the astronauts to take control of a spaceship. Uh, and they're in a power struggle with the computer and the computer's in a power struggle with them. And so it has all kinds of human dimensions, uh, uh, cooperation and conflict, and they're attempting to deceive each other. So it's way advanced. Sophia's not that advanced. But this is just a talking machine. It's not a robot. But you might want to have a look at that movie. 
and you'll see more evidence of where computers could be headed. Although it was imaginary at the time, it's less so now. Okay, well, that, that should wrap up this morning. Uh, and thank you very much for your input, if that's the word. Uh, it's been very interesting uh, engaging with you on this topic. And uh, there's, there's, of course, a lot more to be said about it, which, which basically, in terms of the reading, uh, in a nutshell, there are objections, of course, that Turing raises to his own thesis about a Turing test. And he answers them, as we have seen already with Churchill. He'll raise objections and answer them. And Turing raises more. And the next part of the reading, which I'll go over with my breakout group on Thursday, and hopefully you'll go over in your breakout groups, are Turing's own objections to his thesis and the way in which he answers them. They're very strong objections. And some of you, I'm pleased to see, have yourselves made those objections this morning. You've raised parallel objections, and you're going to see Turing anticipated them and answered them. So that's what we're going to cover on Thursday. All right. Uh, so I hope this has been interesting for you and certainly relevant to our lives, but still posing these philosophical questions. All right. I wish you a very, a very good week, a safe week. Take care of yourselves and uh, I'll upload the video later. Uh, so uh, see some of you on Thursday and, and next week we'll look at Cyril, uh, the last reading of this section when Cyril's going to really take on Turing. He doesn't like Turing. And he's going to tell us what, what humans can do, the machines cannot do. And that, that's going to be next week. All right. So take care, everybody. You're very welcome. I'll stop the recording. Thank you. Yeah. Have okay. a good one, Professor. You're more than welcome. Glad you. Thank you, Professor.